something happening here. This land is your land. If it takes them to paradise, it's down, down, down. There is power in a union. Welcome to TNZ Talk with radio veteran Tony Truppiano and Huffington Post blogger and writer at Liberals Unite, Richard Zombeck, where they do lean left, but always talk straight. And welcome everybody to this Monday, July 25th edition of TNZ Talk. I am Tony Truppiano, and I am joined now by my partner, good friend, and the professor himself, Richard Zombeck. Richard, as always, a pleasure to be with you, sir. The, the professor. I have a friend that calls me every time he answers the phone. He goes, Dr. Z. Well, you know, PhD. It's pilot higher and deeper? Why not? But, uh, you know, <laughs> I see you as a professor. You are a wise man who's taught me a lot. Well, that's that's nice to know. I hope yeah. I hope our listeners feel the same way. I think um, they do. And by the way, I wanted to. But before we go any further, I wanted to thank uh, our listeners down under. We had a, a, a wonderful. I tweeted something last week, and when she responded to my response, she said, "You know, great thoughts and love the show." That's really cool. Yeah, I saw her on Facebook. Um, she said, you guys are really funny, something like that. You guys are really funny, and I'm really enjoying the show from, from Australia. Right. So welcome that was, to our friends down under. I thought that was kind of cool. Absolutely. Well, let me give out the phone number and a little info on TNZ Talk, and we're going to get this underway. Uh, if you'd like to call and leave a message, uh, because we do tape the show, uh, but you're more than welcome to call and leave a message on any topic that's important to you. Chances are it will end up on the podcast. The number to call is 559-898-2551. That's 559-TZ-TALK-1. 559-898-2551. I'll hand the rest of it over to Richard Zombeck. Yeah, and also, who knows, if uh, if it's a good message, and um, maybe we'll have you on the show. Uh of course, if you leave your number or your email in your message, we're not going to play that on the air, uh, but it'll give us a way to get back to you. Also, you can contact us um, through our website at tandztalk.com. Uh, something I do want to mention because things are tight and getting tighter and we do have expenses, uh, you can click on the support tab. And you can find out um, the numerous ways to support us. One uh, very important way, of course, being our Patreon uh, page or Patreon page. I never, I think it's Patreon because it's it is it's, Patreon. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and you can support us. You can for a monthly donation, the price of a coffee, for God's sakes. Um, also, you can find our Twitter feeds, our archives, our Facebook. Uh, address and everything you ever want to know about TNZ Talk individually and as a show, but we're afraid to ask. There you go. <laughs> Excuse me. There you go. Let's let's uh, do it. Well, listen. We unfortunately uh, weren't on during the Republican National Committee uh, convention uh, last week, for the most part, and we should uh, quickly. Uh, recap that because uh, well, it's of us not could hard stop to do. Dry heaving. Yeah, it's not hard to do. The reality is, it was the same. No matter what the theme was, make America safe again, make America work again, whatever, whatever the theme was, uh, it was dark and about terrorists and about jailing a political opponent, which of course only happens in third world countries. And it was uh, really uh, full of hate and vitriol and. Uh, I think that that covers all four days, especially Donald Trump's speech, which I uh, am a little astounded by. And the reason well, I gotta, I'm astounded. Tony, I got to tell you, I'm terrified. I mean, we're, we're all going to die. <laughs> well, and, and, and there there there's something like 180,000 Mexican zombie killers roaming the streets. I mean, he said it himself. They're being released by the tens of thousands into our communities. 
That's well, a direct quote from his speech. Well, well I, one hold of, on. One, <laughs> go, go ahead. Go ahead. I had something things, I wanted to play. but That's all right. One of the, and we'll play it in a second. One of the things that scares the bejesus out of me, and I heard this this morning, that in a recent poll, 75% of the people that listened to his uh, acceptance speech liked it. Uh, I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, I just wanted to play this. I hear hurricanes blowing. I know the end is coming soon. I feel rivers overflowing. I hear the voice of rage and ruin. Right? Yeah, you got that right. <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting, Z. I uh, posted my latest column today, this afternoon. And in it, I criticize the Bernie Bros. Um, but in a very uh, factual way. And I lost three friends in the last 20 minutes. <laughs> Did you really? Yep. Had I known this months ago, I would have written it then. Uh, <laughs> yeah, really? I, I don't want to be friends with anybody that is so tied in into their own psyche that they can't see the forest for the trees. Well, there's a, um, there's a guy that I, that I follow, uh, I, and I think his name's Jim Wright, but he writes for the Stone Kettle uh, Station. It's his own website, and um, he also has done a couple pieces in Salon, and he wrote a big piece to the Bernie bros, basically saying, look, I, I understand you. And if that's the way you want to go, I, I completely uh, defend your right to go with whatever you think your conscience uh, deems necessary. But I'm looking at the long game and I'm looking at Supreme court justices that are going to be here for three or four decades and who's going to be picking those. And that was kind of, a convincer for me. Of course, I, I got I got a little unconvinced um, with the whole uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz should step down, but I'm going to hire her for my campaign uh, fiasco. Uh, that kind of set me off on a whole new uh, trajectory this morning. Uh, um, uh, a vulgar tirade, actually. Uh, yeah. I'm, fo- <laughs> I'm following you, Z. I'm following you, brother. I, I, I see that. <laughs> I see. I don't. I don't. I don't don't think she hired her. I think she appointed her. So I want to be a little careful how we put that. At the same time, I don't think it's going to last. Yeah, but it's really like let's see who can lose worst. I mean, the the two of them that they're tied right now at thirty nine percent. Thirty nine percent. Not neither one of them has even cracked fifty, and they're tied. In fact, he's ahead by three points in some places. Well, and you know how I feel about polls. Um, I know. Let me, let me remind be, you. Be that careful. Michael, My last name is Zombek, and I am a poll. Uh-huh. Um, Michael Dukakis <laughs> was up 17 points on George Herbert Walker Bush at this point, up 17 points, and got annihilated in the general. So <laughs> that that's what polls do for us. And I'm so tired of the 538 blog moving the target. If you're going to keep moving the target i'm gonna stop paying attention because it just gets old yeah i'm getting a little sick of nate silver anyway yeah um we have a lot of audio to get to and i think that it would be and we'll 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 mention that again we're focusing a little bit on the republican national convention we'll talk about tim kane in a little bit and uh whatever we can get to in this hour but we should be able to do every show this week uh, God willing. So let, let's start with uh, with this. Um, Donald Trump was on Meet the Press, and he talked about uh, a handful of things. But let's Z, just go with the first one, Trump on Meet the Press uh, copy, and then we'll get to the uh, other. T- oh, so we have two other ones, and then we'll get to the other two. Okay. Into the new Democratic ticket later in the show, including my interview with Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont in a moment. But. First, we're going to talk about also about Sanders, about those WikiLeaks emails and what they may say about DNC favoritism towards Hillary Clinton. But we begin with the man who has now taken control of the Republican Party, its nominee, Donald Trump. I traveled to Trump National Golf Club in Bedminster, New Jersey, sort of his weekend getaway last night, for a face-to-face interview. 
since dropping the word presumptive. It's his first one from the nominee title. We touched on so much. Tim Kaine, Trump's tax returns, his proposed restrictions on Muslim immigration, and why he says he alone can fix the country's problems. But I began by asking him how it feels to be the Republican nominee for president of the United States. Well, it really feels great. And we really have a very unified party, other than a very small group of people that, frankly, lost. And we have a very unified party. You saw that the other night with the love in the room and, and the enthusiasm in them. The enthusiasm. There are people that say they have never seen anything like what was going on in that room, especially Thursday well, night. Let me tell you, bring up Thursday night. I got to ask you about your entrance before we get serious okay, here. Fine. That Monday night entrance was something right. else. I know you've gotten a lot of feedback on it. Well, I How'd you come up a little bit lucky, and a couple of people had that idea, and I went along with the idea, and everything just worked right. And it was so good that they wanted to do it on Thursday night. I said, never in a million years, because you'll never get it that way again. I, I don't think I've seen that even on WWE. Yeah, I know. Well, Vince is a good friend of mine. He called me. He said that was a very, very good entrance. But I didn't want to do it a second time, because, right. you know, it never works out the second time. All right, let's go into the speech. I want to put some meat on the bones, but okay. first let's talk about... You've seen some of the uh, positive reviews, some of the negative reviews. Uh, some of the negative has been it was a little dark. That's that the there wasn't thing. enough optimism in it. And right. what would you say? There was not. It's not morning in America. Yeah. What would you say to that? Well, I think the only negativity, and you know, the the I call them the haters, and that's fine. But the only negative reviews were a little dark. And the following day, they had another attack. And then today, you see what happened in Afghanistan with many, many people killed. They, don't, they have no idea how many, so many killed. Uh, yesterday, it was Munich. And, uh, you know, I, I know they're saying maybe it wasn't terrorism, maybe it was just a crazy guy. But in the meantime, he's screaming Allah Akbar as he's shooting people. So, you know, we'll see what, how that turns out. Uh, and all of a sudden, people said maybe it wasn't dark at all. But... Only the only thing that some people said it was a little dark. It was a little bit tough. Did you think it was a little dark? No, little I tough? thought it was very optimistic. Okay. I, to me, it was an optimistic speech because what makes it optimistic? Uh, in your because view? we're going to solve the problems. We're going to solve the problems. In other words, sure, I talk about the problems, but we're going to solve the problems. Yes, he alone will solve the problems. O only me. I am the one. I am the only one that can do this. I and he said that too. That's that was the most shocking. I alone can do not, this. Not not we. And yeah, you know, that's disturbing on a lot of fronts. It it truly is. <laughs> um, you think? Yeah, there's no question about that. It's very disturbing. Anyway, he went on, and and we're just moving quickly today because we have a lot to get to. But he went on to talk about Brexit and what he had to say. I, I, people really need to pay attention, see what he had to say. And I You're was, not worried about it. You think a fractured Europe is good for America? No, no. But we're spending a lot of money on Europe. Don't forget, Europe got together. Why primarily did they get together? So that they could beat the United States when it comes to making money, in other words, on trade. It's an economic question. Okay? And now we talk about Europe like so wonderful. Hey, I love Europe. I have property in Europe. I'm just saying, the reason that it got together was like a consortium so it could compete with the United What you're States. saying is all this stuff's good for America, even if it's not good for Europe? Look, you take a look at Airbus. They make more planes now than Boeing. Okay? They got together. All of these countries got together so that they could beat the United States. Okay, so we're in competition. So, you know, we're in competition in one way, we're helping them in another way. It is so messed up. The Muslim. All right, and we're going to get to the Muslim yeah. ban in a moment. But, but think about what he said, Z. Um, this sounds so isolationist. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it, it feeds into his entire us against them. Uh, and, you know, the rest of the world... And many of the corporations in this country uh, are are looking at at the globe, right? I mean, we're looking at globalization. There's no, there there's no um, there's no avoiding that. There's no there's no um, walking that back. There's no bringing manufacturing jobs back here unless people here want to work for two dollars a day. Uh, you know, and the thing is too is when you talk to a lot of these corporations, right? They and the, the, and they actually make sense from from a global stance is 
you know, they say, well, you know, they, they get accused of, well, you, you know, you're moving all this stuff to, to India and to the Philippines. And they look at you and they go, yeah, we've created a middle class in India and the Philippines. We've, we've created wealth in India and the Philippines. People can live and afford things and buy things. And, you know, I mean, granted, there's, there's some question to it, but it's actually not a bad argument, right? It is, you know, this, we're, we're finding cheap labor. We're creating a middle class in these other parts of the world that didn't. We're taking people out of poverty. And in the meantime, we're, we're creating stuff and making stuff that you can actually afford on the cheap at Walmart for 10 bucks, where if we were paying someone even the minimum wage here, uh, it would cost you four or five times as much, right? So this plan to bring manufacturing back and to, and to bring coal mining back is, is ludicrous. I mean, if, if he had a plan of like, listen... Yeah, see, let me let me just interrupt you for a moment. Uh, you're actually talking about things that he didn't. Yeah, well. he didn't mention one of these things in his speech. And if you would allow me for just a moment to read some headlines from some major mainstream media sources after his speech, you ready? Yeah. The Washington Post headline: In acceptance speech, Trump's America is a dark and desperate place. CBS News, Donald Trump offers dark vision of America in GOP convention speech. NBC News, Donald Trump takes America on a journey to the dark side. CNBC, Trump's emotional and dark message, how will it play out? Rolling Stone, watch Donald Trump's dark, fear-mongering RNC speech. The Huffington Post, Donald Trump's dark and scary night. Mother Jones, Donald Trump and the dark soul of the GOP. The New Yorker, Donald Trump's dark, dark convention speech. The Nation, Donald Trump's angry, dark convention speech caps off a disastrous RNC. And finally, the Boston Globe, the dark, frightening America of Donald Trump. Yeah, actually, Matt Taibbi also had an article in the Rolling Stones that was phenomenal. Um, <laughs> so... My turn. Let me read something real quick for you here, because this is um, this is from the Washington Post. I'll tell you who it is in a minute. A week ago, I felt good about America, but no more. Coyotes are running freely in the streets of our big cities. The stock market is teetering on the verge of collapse. The monetary system will soon go belly up. China and North Korea and Iran have knives to our throats. Our schools are in chaos. Politicians corrupt. The media stupefied by political correctness, and everywhere you look, you hear foreign accents. We're on the edge of the abyss. At my house, we've begun fortifying the basement walls with sandbags and are laying in barrels of fresh water and K-rations. We refuse to be at the mercy of the government when liberals decide to shut down the water supply. We have purchased flame flowers, f uh, flamethrowers that are much more effective than firearms, and we have enough napalm to fight off platoons of invaders, plus the attic holds four tons of dynamite that is wired to a single switch in the refrigerator. When we go, we'll take the whole neighborhood with us. <laughs> And Garrison, that's Garrison Keeler, Gar yeah. Garrison Keeler on the Washington Post today. That I, uh, was beautiful. I, I posted that this morning and yeah, got quite absolutely a beautiful to it. Yeah, absolutely. And this is this is this is what we're living with, right? And I mean, you have Obama who came out the next day and said, "I'm sure people got up and the sun was shining and the birds were chirping." And it was kind of flip. It was kind of a coy response to this, and I think it needed to be. He got hammered for it. Um, and, uh, by, by the right of like, you know, he's not taking it seriously. And, but the thing is, Tony, is that there, there are people who listen to Trump's speech and actually believe that this is true, that what he's saying, and he told no less than 21 lies during his speech. And let's, uh, well, yeah. And, and, and it was amazing. Let's get to the last clip and then we'll really round out this conversation because it gets even better from there. Uh, Donald Trump also talked to Chuck Todd on Meet the Press about the Muslim ban. And again, pay attention to the word expansion. I think you've pulled back from it, but you tell me. We must immediately suspend immigration from any nation that has been compromised by terrorism until such time as proven vetting mechanisms have been put in place. This feels like a slight rollback. I don't think I Should we back. interpret it? 
that as that? I don't think so. Okay. I actually don't think it's a pullback. In fact, you could say it's an expansion. I'm looking now at territories. People were so upset when I used the word Muslim. Oh, you can't use the word Muslim. Remember this. And I'm okay with that because I'm talking territory instead of Muslim. But just remember this. Our Constitution is great. But it doesn't necessarily give us the right to commit suicide, okay? Now, we have a religious, you know, everybody wants to be protected, and that's great. And that's the wonderful part of our Constitution. I view it differently. Why are we committing suicide? Why are we doing that? But you know what? I live with our Constitution. I love our Constitution. I cherish our Constitution. We're making it territorial. We have nations, and we'll come out. I'm going to be coming out over the next few weeks with a number of the places. And it's very complex well, because I was just we have say, problems in Germany, and we have problems in France. I was just France. going to ask that. You know, so it's not would, just would this limit would immigration from France? What we're going to have is a thing called... They've been compromised by terrorism. They have totally been. And you know why? It's their own fault. Because they allowed people to come so into their territory. So you would toughen up. You're basically saying, hey... You know, French want to come over here, you got to go through an extra check. It's their own fault because they've allowed people over years to come into their territory. And that's why Brexit happened, okay? Because the UK is saying, we're tired of this stuff. What's going on, we're tired of. But listen to this. We could get to the point where you're not allowing a lot of people to come into this country well, from we a get lot of places. That. Maybe we get to that point. Chuck, look what's happening. Mm -hmm. Look at what just took place in Afghanistan where they blow up a whole shopping center with people. They, they have no idea how many people are even killed. Happened today. So we have to be smart and we have to be vigilant. We have to be strong. So we can't be the stupid So people. France, Germany... Spain, so here's my places turn. that have been compromised? Here is what I want. All right. Extreme vetting. Tough word. Yeah. Extreme vetting. What does that look we like? We have to have tough. We're going to have tough standards. And if a person can't one. prove that they're from an area, and if a person can't prove what they have to be able to prove, they're not coming into this country. And I so, so really, uh, his parents, who he claims are Swedish, but they were German, um, or his grandparents or whoever the hell they were, wouldn't have been able to come over because of the atrocities that the Germans had committed during World War II. Is that, is that right? Do I have well, that right? I think that according to the way he sees it, you're 100% right. Yeah. And how come nobody's calling him on that crap? Why isn't anybody calling him on most of his crap? Um, well, yeah, I know. It's, it's like, oh, well, no, here, come here. Here's a microphone. Say whatever you want. Um, I've got nothing really to say. I, I personally don't know anything about history myself and think that you're just wonderful and want to have you back on. So I'm not even going to question what you have to say. So please, by all means, spew away. Okay, I, it, it's just it's it's just ludicrous. I, I mean, it's just ludicrous. Well, it's not that Donald Trump hasn't attracted new people to the GOP. I think that we can agree on that. Uh, and I was listening to NPR yesterday, and there was a former Bernie supporter that is now supporting Donald Trump, and her reasoning was what you would expect it to be. Um, at the same time, not all of the people that are inspired by Donald Trump are necessarily people we would want them to be. And in fact, one of them is former Grand Knight of the KKK, David Duke. Yeah. And we have an interesting mashup to play for you that juxtaposes Duke against Trump, and then we'll let people decide for themselves. Go ahead and play that, Z. I'm overjoyed to see Donald Trump and most Americans embrace most of the issues that I've championed for years. My slogan remains America first. Our plan will put America first. I was the first major candidate in modern times to promote the term and policy of America first. As long as we are led by politicians who will not put America first, then we can be assured that other nations will not treat America with respect. Will you unequivocally condemn David Duke and say that you don't want his vote or that of other white supremacists in this election? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Did, did he endorse me? So you're asking me a question that I'm supposed to be talking about people that I know nothing about. Okay. I mean, I'm just talking about David Duke and the Ku Klux Klan here. But 
You wouldn't want me to condemn a group that I know nothing about. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. New York Times admitted that my platform became the GOP mainstream. I am your voice. Yeah. <laughs> Let, let's let's address the excuse the pun the elephant in the room. Do you believe that Donald Trump is truly a racist? Uh, yeah. All right. I mean, we know he's a misogynist, so we'll, well, we'll set that you, aside. Did, did you hear what he said about his accountants? Yeah. Yeah. So just for the people listening who haven't, um, he basically said he wants a little midget with a yarmulke. Uh, and uh, right now he's got a, he's, at the time, he's got a black accountant now and believes that that's the wrong way to go because he thinks blacks are fundamentally lazy. <sighs> Direct quote. Well, paraphrased, but quote from Donald Trump. Donald, Donald, maybe not Donald Trump's own words, but his words nonetheless. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I mean, oh, seriously. My. And I mean, I mean, Tony, I, what? Uh, I mean, I just, I, I, don't, I don't get it. I don't, I don't get it. I mean, I saw an article the other day that people in this country were were possibly suffering from PTSD, and I don't know if that's presidential traumatic stress disorder. Or what? But but that that there are clear signs that a majority of people, uh, a, a large percentage of people in this country, uh, may very well be suffering from PTSD. And um, <clears throat> you know when when we were watching the convention, there was a lot more going on at the convention that we didn't see. Um, when. Um, and I forget his name now, the, the PayPal billionaire, openly gay uh, billionaire who wants to live forever and is trying to figure out how. Um, I mean, people people were calling him the F word uh, in the crowd. They were screaming faggot um, while he was talking. Uh, there, was, there was booing going on. There were people that were hanging their head in disbelief that this is where we were at. So to us at home, watching the convention on TV, it looked like, you know, rah, 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 Caesar, um, put her in prison, jail her, lock her up. But to the reporters, at least the good ones, like Matt Taibbi, and I would suggest that people go, it's it's on our Facebook page. There's a link to the article on our Facebook page and Twitter, uh, Matt Taibbi in the Rolling Stone, who was at the RNC, had a very different take on what was happening there. Now, that still doesn't explain why. Um, and, and you know, the thing is, too, is to say that doesn't ex- I was going to say that doesn't explain why he's so popular, but he's not. He's at 39 percent. He's at 39, 39 percent. That's all. The problem is, is that so is Hillary Clinton. Well, you know, there's that post-convention bump, and she'll get one yeah. as well. But yeah. that's not okay. enough. It's not enough. It, it's not enough. Uh, it's not close to enough. And so, you know, it, it, it's, it's fascinating. Let me just, again, during the Meet the Press interview yesterday, Chuck Todd asked the following question. Would you support a Democrat over David Duke if he if it was necessary to defeat him? Trump's response, Z, I guess, depending on who the Democrat is, but the answer would be yes. So His he had, words. He had, he had to think about that. His words, not mine. So take it for what it's worth. Um All right. The the next uh, two pieces of audio are actually three. The two of them are rather long, but I don't know how to do this without uh, doing it because it's Jon Stewart on The Tonight Show. And it was both hilarious and Jon Stewart-ish. And I know you're a big fan of Jon Stewart, Z. Yeah, I am. And why wouldn't you be? Yeah, Um, extremely bright guy. 
Yeah, and he goes after Sean Hannity, who he doesn't name by name, but you'll you'll get you'll get the reference when it comes. So why don't we go with uh, copy four and get this thing going? Have a, have Fit Bond goes right on the hair. Have a have a good time. That's all right. Thank you so much. Uh, hello, how are you? Well, the convention's over. Uh, I thought Donald Trump was going to speak. Uh, Ivanka said that he was going to come out. She said he was really compassionate and generous. Uh, but then this angry groundhog came out. And uh, <laughs> he just vomited on everybody for an hour. But the Republicans appear to have a very clear plan uh, for America. They've uh, articulated it th- throughout the convention. Uh, one, jail your political opponent. Uh, two, <laughs> inject Rudy Giuliani with a speedball and Red Bull enema. And... Uh, <laughs> And then three, spend the rest of the time scaring the holy bejesus out of everybody. (laughs) But I'm not interested in that. I'm actually interested in gymnastics. With the uh, Rio Olympics coming up, I'm enjoying the gymnastics portion of the program that's about to occur. That will be the contortions that many conservatives will now have to do to embrace Donald J. Trump. A man who clearly embodies all the things that they have for years said that they have hated about Barack Obama. The most inexperienced nominee to ever run for president. One of the most divisive presidents in history. Notoriously thin-skinned. And straightforwardly authoritarian. He's a raging narcissist who has no grip on reality. A thin-skinned narcissist with no government experience. Yes, that sounds exactly like Barack Obama. (laughs) So now the right-wing media is going to have to spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week, justifying this choice they've made. Can they make the turn? (laughs) They already are. Let's trace their journey through the eyes of one of their most talented gymnasts. Um... Ah, his name escapes me. Let's just refer to him as Lumpy. (laughs) Hey, Lumpy. For instance, here's how Lumpy felt about Barack Obama's divisiveness. This president, the most divisive president in history, scare tactics, class warfare, racial rhetoric, divided along racial lines, rich versus poor, black versus white, old versus young. Cats versus dogs! (laughs) Batman versus Superman! I've been out of the business a while. I don't know what that is, actually. Uh, Well, if you don't like divisiveness, what about when Trump suggested Mexico is sending us their rapists? If you don't like divisive rhetoric... Perhaps inarticulate, but he did say, you know, some people are good people. He didn't say all Mexicans. Oh, no, you're right. And Cinco de Mayo, we had the Trump Tower Taco Bowl. And that's uh, one of the healingest meals on the Trump Tower menu. I am not an expert uh, on racial unity. But I do believe that some of our more vaunted historical leaders in that area did retweet white supremacists less than Trump. (laughs) So I believe, I'm just saying. (laughs) Then there was the Obama crony that Lumpy couldn't stand, his old friend Teleprompty. President Obama, he can't read a sentence without a teleprompter. He sleeps with the darn thing. Probably sleeps with the darn thing and then probably doesn't call it the next day because it didn't say so on the teleprompter. <laughs> Lumpy, you're 180, please. We've seen him now give a series of, of policy speeches using a teleprompter, staying on message, really well done for somebody who had never done it before. You hate teleprompters! <laughs> you're saying now teleprompters are for stupid people, and I thought Trump handled it pretty good. <laughs> Okay, inexperience aside, divisiveness aside, the worst thing about Barack Obama is his elitism. 
Barack Obama is anything but mainstream. Sitting in his million-dollar home, claiming to be for the people, we have to wonder how in touch he is with the average American. Take a look at him ordering his burger with a very special condiment. Dijon mustard? I hope you enjoyed that fancy burger, Mr. President. <laughs> yeah, you elitist. You probably eat that burger with your mouth <laughs> instead of acting like a real American and having a Magnum fired up your ass like they serve them, <laughs> like they serve them at Arby's. That's how they serve them, actually, at Arby's. They shoot them right up your ass. <laughs> I, just, I love John Stewart. <laughs> he, he is amazing, and um, when he was showing those, or when he was playing those vignettes of uh you know he's thin-skinned he's a narcissist and and um they were talking about barack obama when he came back there was of course a picture of donald trump yeah uh, how could there not be yeah absolutely well anyway he went on and uh again the whole thing was just so worth listening to uh that we had to play it so z if you would part two or actually part five how lumpy feels about the guy who sits in a literal golden throne at the top of a golden tower with his name in gold letters at the top of it eating pizza with a knife and fork. <laughs> how do you feel about that guy I thought one of the more fascinating descriptions of your dad came from you you once called him on my show a blue collar billionaire <laughs> that's not a thing It is true. Trump does seem like the kind of guy you want to sit down and own a fleet of airplanes with. Look, all, all that stuff is actually superficial. And I'm sure it's easy for people without ethics or principles to embrace someone who embodies everything that they said they hated about the previous president for the past eight years. Because really for a president, it's about what's inside. And that's where Lumpy and friends, that's where they really have found the president lacking. Who sits in the pews of Jeremiah uh, G.D. America and America's chickens have come home to roost after 9-11? Is, is that a Christian church to you? Say, he says he's a Christian. I'm a Christian. I wouldn't go to Reverend Wright's church. Obama would. <laughs> he's the type of Christian that's, you know, not Christian. <laughs> well, you know what, though? When the Pope said that Trump's talk about immigration was not Christian, surely that gave lumpy pause. Who is the Pope to say that Donald Trump's not a Christian? How can a pope or anybody right. decide if somebody's a Christian in their heart? Yeah! Who died and made that guy pope? <laughs> no one, actually, right? Just, oh, I feel like I just retired. I feel that. So let's just say it for real. Here's where we are. Either Lumpy and his friends are lying about being bothered by thin-skinned, authoritarian, less-than-Christian readers of Prompter being president... Or they don't care, as long as it's their thin-skinned, prompter, authoritarian, tyrant, narcissist. You just want that person to give you your country back, because you feel that you're this country's rightful owners. There's only one problem with that. This country isn't yours. You don't own it. It never was. There is no real America. You don't own it. You don't own patriotism. You don't own Christianity. You sure as hell don't own respect for the bravery and sacrifice of military, police, and firefighters. Trust me. I saw a lot of people. I saw a lot of people on the convention floor in Cleveland with their Blue Lives Matter rhetoric who either remained silent or actively fought against the 9-11 First Re Responders Bill reauthorization. I see you and I see you. We're live. <laughs> Never been on a television show with stakes before. So I see you. You got a problem with those uh, Americans fighting for their place at the table. You got a problem with them because you feel like the, uh, what's Representative Steve King's word for it? Subgroups of Americans are being divisive. 
Well, if you have a problem with that, take it up with the founders. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. <laughs> Sorry, big up. Respect, Lin-Manuel. <laughs> Those fighting to be included in the ideal of equality are not being divisive. Those fighting to keep those people out are. So, Lumpy, you and your friends have embraced Donald Trump. Clearly, the C next to your names don't stand for constitutional or conservative, but cravently convenient. <laughs> and that's the end of that. But well worth uh, listening to, Z, you have to agree. He's got a real issue with uh, with the 9-11 responders, too, and how they weren't taken care of. In fact, he was he was in Congress uh, with some of the 9-11 responders talking to um, legislators and getting the runaround and experiencing what they've uh, had to deal with and endure while they're dying uh, and not being compensated for it or insured or helped really in any way by Congress uh, and mostly by Republicans who keep blocking these bills. I mean, it's disgusting. It really, it really is disgusting. And and when you watch some of the stuff that he's had to go through, there's a video out there um, of him walking around with some of these firefighters and and police officers, and and you know the they're losing they're losing friends, and they're like, yeah, another one died last week, and you know they've they've got all this this stuff going on, and they can't get any um, they can't get any help, Tony. No, they can't, and that is a damn shame. And, and I don't want to deflect away from that, but uh, uh, back to John Stewart for a moment. Lumpy, of course, was Sean Hannity, uh, if that wasn't clear to people, and I'm sure it was. Uh, Sean Hannity had a response. The problem with the response we'll get to on the other side, but it's quite short, and let us play Sean Hannity's rant on his own show. And here's Lumpy. I see they brought that idiot, John Stewart, back from the dead. And uh, great, attack me all you want. I was right about Obama. And you were a fool who had his head, had your head so far up, up Obama's ass, John Stewart. I've never seen anybody kiss an ass like you kiss his. And now you're sucking up to him, putting your ass, your head up Hillary's ass and sucking up to her, too. Fine. The country's not better off, John, because John Stewart, we've got 95 million Americans out of the labor force, John. Do you care about them? I know you're a rich liberal. Are you donating money to those families, the, the 46 million uh, American families on food stamps, John? Hey, John, are you helping out the 50 million Americans in poverty? Hey, John, are you going to help use your wealth from all your comedy writers that, that lay out the material for you? Are you going to help pay down the debt that Obama's accumulated, more debt than every other president before him combined? Are you going to help, John, the one in five American families in the country? that don't have a single family member that have a job. I know you're rich enough, you don't have to work anymore. But these people are dying to work. And just like kids, they they suck it up, they do what we tell them to do, they get their degree, and what happens? They end up living back in their mommy and daddy's basements because they can't get a job. Wow. Okay, and we don't want to talk about the millions of jobs that have been created. And, yes, many of them are not the good-paying middle-class jobs we were hoping for. But the the economy has grown. And the debt is down. And the deficit is down. And unemployment is down. So, uh, Sean, Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's time you start using facts instead of opinion. Uh, But as he said, uh, he's a Republican. He'll be voting for Donald Trump, and he is partisan, as are we. And so I, I don't attack that. But um, well, we'll have, was, to, we'll have to look up how much he donates. Yeah, you're right. We will. Um, moving on from there, uh, let, let's talk a little bit, and, and then we'll get to some other audio. But let's talk a little bit about the. Uh, Announcement on Friday that Tim Kaine would be Hillary Clinton's running mate. I know you are not enamored with that choice. No, I'm not at all. Well, tell people why. Well, uh, one, he's um, he's anti-abortion, which is which is a large detail. But for me, uh, not 
not the the main one. He's also very pro bank, and in fact, <clears throat> you would think <clears throat> yes. that he wasn't around in two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine, because he wants to deregulate the banking industry. Well, here's the dun, let's, dun, let's, dun. let's take issue one. Uh, he is pro life, but his voting record is pro choice. Um, and and he's explained that, and I thought it made a great deal of sense <clears throat> that although he does believe, um, he does not believe that abortion is murder. He's just pro life. Um, he does believe that women should have a cho- their choice to do whatever they want to do right. with their bodies, <laughs> and the uh, abortion rights groups, um, <clears throat> NARAL and Planned Parenthood. Uh, are fine with his position. And I, so I want to make that clear. The second point, ain't no justifying. No. No, in fact, he sent letters <laughs> out to some of the biggest banks before he was picked for VP just to let them know that he was on their side. Well, we'll see how they deal with that throughout the campaign. There's also a problem that he has with accepting gifts that totaled $160,000. And uh, although in an age where now the Supreme Court has made those kind of issues a moot point, um, it, it's not something that necessarily uh, is going to be ignored and hasn't been by <clears throat> at real Donald Trump. Um, but it is Tim Kaine, and we're going to have to, to live with that. Uh, this morning, when I did my interview on the USA Radio Network, uh, we did talk briefly about that choice. Uh, interestingly, and I thought this was rather odd, uh, Angie Austin, the host of that show, thought that giving part of his speech on Friday or on Saturday in Spanish was unfortunate because she, like many other Americans, don't speak Spanish. And, of course, I found that, uh, well, a a little stupid. Yeah, and a number of Spanish speakers didn't care. Right. Right. I mean, they they were asked, what do you think about uh, Tim Kaine speaking Spanish, huh? And they were like, well, don't care. Yeah. So, you know, it it is what it is. I I think that uh, ultimately... He'll be okay. Um, You know, Bernie Sanders addressed that. Uh, And speaking of Bernie Sanders, he was on Meet the Press yesterday as well. Chuck Todd had a good day yesterday. Chuck, Yeah, yeah, well, Chuck Todd. No, I mean in in the way that... (laughs) um, No, no, I I mean that in the way that uh, he got good interviews. Um, He had trouble with Trump. He really did. Do we, I get the impression he's a little right leaning. Do you get the same impression? Um, yeah, a little bit. Um, but I think he, I think he does okay. And and you'll hear it. I think in the Bernie Sanders interview, uh, with representing both sides of the aisle. But yeah, I, I do get the impression he leans a little right. Uh, you know, when David Gregory had that seat. He changed radically. He used to be very left-leaning and then suddenly was not. And I don't know what changes somebody to do that. Yeah, and well, and, and King on CNN, there's absolutely no question. Yeah, so don't get it. Don't get it. Anyway, uh, let's listen to a little bit of Bernie Sanders on Meet the Press yesterday. The DNC was hacked a few months ago. Among the emails was one from the DNC's chief financial officer, Brad Marshall, that was looking ahead to the contests in Kentucky and West Virginia in early May. While not mentioning Sanders specifically by name, the email appeared to question Sanders' faith. He wrote this, quote, does he believe in a God? I think I read he is an atheist. This could make several points difference with my peeps. My Southern Baptist peeps would draw a big difference between a Jew and a Jew and an atheist. Well, Sanders has long believed that DNC Chair Debbie Washington Schultz was was in Clinton's corner the whole campaign. Well, he joins me now. Senator Sanders, welcome back to Meet the Press. And I should note that you talked about your belief in God last 
fall in an interview, I think, with the uh, with your hometown paper there. So I want to get that out of the way. But let me start with this question, questioning your faith. Brad Marshall uh, apologized on Facebook. Has anyone apologized to you personally? And what is your response to this entire discussion? Well, no, nobody has apologized to me. And as you just mentioned, this really does not come as a shock to me or my supporters. Uh, there is no question what the DNC was on Secretary Clinton's side from day one. We all know that. Uh, and I think, as I have said a long time ago, that the time is now for Debbie Wasserman Schultz uh, to step aside, not only for these issues. We need a Democratic Party that is open, that's going to bring young people and working people into it, that is going to stand up and take on the big money interests and fight for working families. Uh, I don't think Debbie has been that type of leader. So I would hope, and I said this many months ago, that she would step right. aside. We would have new leadership. And do you think it needs to happen now, today, before the start of the convention? If that if, Would that help well, calm some of your supporters down? Well, I think what is already happening is that it's clear she is not going to be speaking to the convention. That is the right thing. I think right now what we have got to focus on as Democrats uh, is defeating uh, perhaps the worst Republican candidate that I have seen in my lifetime. Uh, Donald Trump would be a disaster for this country. He must be defeated. Uh, we've got to elect Secretary Clinton on every single issue. Uh, fighting for the middle class on health care, on climate change, is a far, far superior uh, candidate uh, to Trump. That's where I think the focus has got to be. Uh, what do you think? Well, you know, he spoke this afternoon, as you know, and uh, he spoke to his delegates who booed. Uh, not booed him, booed what he had to say. Yeah. Um, and it'll be interesting to see what his speech is like this evening, which we'll talk about tomorrow. I'm sure we'll have some audio from. Uh, but tonight is critical. Tonight is absolutely critical. And I shared with you earlier today, I talked to some people deep inside the convention, people that are well connected to the convention. And they are very concerned about the protesters, not that they'll get violent, but that they will stop the unity and there is talk of uh, doing all kinds of things to disrupt the convention, including when Tim Kaine uh, speaks on Wednesday, that they will turn, stand up and turn their backs to him, which would be very, very disrespectful. Um, and that, uh, you know, they and, and other things. I mean, they continue to uh, gather in large crowds. Uh, I don't know that even he can settle them down. Yeah, and I mean, everything that I'm hearing, too, is that the protests at the DNC are going to dwarf uh, anything that happened at the RNC. They already are. Yeah. I mean, they already are. And yeah. so, you know, there are thousands of people there that aren't getting into the convention hall, thousands of them. And, you know, you know that when you have a convention, uh, the vast majority of people stay, you know, half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour away mm -hmm from where the convention is at. Mm -hmm. And so to make that kind of commitment uh, and, you know, people have, you know, room shared with complete strangers. And the only thing they have in common is a hate for Hillary Clinton at this point. It's not even pro Bernie. It's anti Hillary. Well, and there's, there's a lot out there again, Tony, she's 39%. No, I mean, uh, how, how, do, how, how did we even get here? <laughs> I wrote today that the things that she must do, and I can bullet point them, but I, I'm not going to do it right now. It, it, it's Her speech on Thursday night isn't just the most important speech of her political life. It is the most important speech that a potential world leader must give. And if she does not show true, sincere leadership on Thursday night, she could easily lose this thing. Thursday is beyond critical. I don't even have the right adjective to use, but it's beyond critical. Yeah. So. Uh, I'm, I'm feeling less than hopeful. Oh, what tangled webs we weave. Um, anyway. And the rest of that? And the rest of that? Yeah, go ahead. When first we practice to deceive. Thank you. Um, let's end the show today with... Donald Trump Jr. Donald Trump Jr. has become a uh, important surrogate now for the campaign. And of course, he and his siblings were praised for their amazing performances. He 
And God knows they were performances because there's nothing they said that is close to being true. Now, listen, they can. I, I we, you and I discussed this last week. We have to agree that Donald Trump must have done, done a decent job raising his children because they are respected. Uh, they are successful business people in their own right. Uh, and, and I give them that. And they should be protecting their pop, right? I mean, that's part of their job. Uh, you can't get up and, and bash the guy. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. But, and before we play this, I do, you know, Ivanka was probably the highlight uh, of of the RNC only because the speech she gave looked like it was ripped out of the pages of the DNC. Uh, she talked about equal pay. She talked about maternity leave. She talked about just about everything that's on, on the DNC's uh, platform and completely contrary to what the RNC. And the thing that got me was people were cheering for that. They were cheering. They were right on. They were putting their fists up. She was talking about equal pay for women. They're going nuts. She was talking about maternity leave. They're going nuts. I mean, it was unbelievable. She was talking about health insurance for everyone. They were going nuts. It was like, I'm looking at this going, what the hell is going on? And the other thing I wanted to bring up was a meme that I saw. So it's not my own thought, but... Uh, how do you think Obama would have been greeted by the Republicans if he had shown up with five children from different from three different women? Yeah, um, <laughs> there is always that. <laughs> amazing, absolutely amazing. Well, anyway, this is Donald Trump Jr. on CNN with Jake Tapper, and he gets a little heated. Not Jake, but Donald Trump Jr care of our people we have to get some law and order back into this world because it doesn't exist and if president obama wants to go on the air and say look at the america we live in it's so phenomenal today versus eight years ago i don't think i know an american that believes that to be the case we're in a mess and we have to finally acknowledge that jake sound bites are wonderful but we actually have to do something in terms of action for a change well let me play devil's advocate here uh because uh yes. i want to push back a little bit um the crime rate is down overall nationwide and has been trending down. Unemployment is much, much lower than when President Obama took office. Now, I'm not de defending... Hey, Jake, wait, wait, wait. Uh, Jake let's, talk, let's talk about ahead. that. We, we, let's talk about the murder rate for cops skyrocketing. Let's talk about the real unemployment rate, because the way we actually measure unemployment is, after X number of months, if someone can't find a job, congratulations, they're miraculously off. When you talk about underemployment, which Obamacare has destroyed, people that are working 30 hours a week instead of 40 hours a week so that companies don't have to put them on Obamacare. When you talk about people that just aren't even registered because they don't count them. They've been out of work for so long. They'd love to work if they could, but they can't. That doesn't count. These are artificial numbers, Jake. These are numbers that are massaged to make the existing economy look good, to make this administration look good, when in fact, it's a total disaster. So let's talk about real numbers. You know, when we talk about the numbers as they see it, it's fake accounting, Jake. It doesn't really work. And that's not what the actual state of this country is. So when your father, if your father becomes president, he won't use the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, unemployment rate, he'll use the overall rate, which includes people who uh, have left the workforce and people who work part time. He'll, he, he's going to switch because every president uses, uh, has used the, the typical number. He's going to use this, this number that includes everything. Listen, I, I, I don't know what he's going to do. I have, I'm not a policy wonk in terms of what we're going to decide to do. But I think we have to acknowledge that there's those numbers and then there's the real situation. And they're very different, okay? We all understand that. You're acknowledging that at least. Let's talk about it. I think those are the people that my father's speaking. Those are the people that have been forgotten in this country. And that's exactly what it is. Yeah, you know, unemployment's great because these people just can't even find jobs, so they don't even count anymore. Those are the people we're talking to. Those are the people we want to put to work, Jake. Those are the people that can't feed their families. And we're telling them that they're miraculously employed because some bureaucrat in D.C. says, well, these are the way the numbers read. It doesn't work that way in the real world. Your father raised the prospect of bringing on Roger Ailes, the former chairman and, and CEO of Fox News. Uh, and, and the idea being, uh, Mr. Trump said something along the lines of people are talking about maybe he would run my campaign. Is that actually in play, Roger Ailes coming on board and running the campaign? 
Not that I'm aware of. I mean, I know they're friends and they have a long-term relationship, but I'm very happy with the work that Paul Manafort's doing. I think our team is really coming into, you know, into place and swing. Uh, it's been exciting to be a, you know, a fly on the wall watching a lot of this stuff go down because, you know, again, we're trying to give a voice to the people who've been forgotten, uh, and I think the campaign's doing a wonderful job. Uh, lastly, Don, your speech, uh, obviously very well received, and there are Republicans out there wondering if you might run for office someday yourself. It's even been raised, a possible run against New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio. Are these uh, ideas that you're contemplating? Look, uh, my dad hung out with Roger Ailes in nudie bars, and they harassed women together. And uh, yeah, I think he'd be a good asset for the campaign. Oh, man. You know, what do you think of Michael Bloomberg coming out uh, and saying that he's going to he hasn't done it yet. But the, the, the uh, word is he's going to endorse Hillary Clinton. Now, this is a guy that's pretty Republican. Well, here's a guy that's pretty Republican that may speak at the DNC uh, in favor of Hillary Clinton. And a guy who, uh, much like Donald Trump supposedly is, uh, is a very good businessman uh, and has been... Uh, infinitely more successful than Donald Trump and can prove it. So that's so what do I think? I think that's going to be very interesting, Tony. Yeah, it is going to be very interesting. Anyway, we need to wrap things up for today. Uh, but certainly the last week has been fascinating. This week is critical for the Democrats. They need to get their stuff together and they need to do it very very quickly uh, because it's not starting off very well, and I don't think that was an accident. Uh, certainly, WikiLeaks knew what they were doing. Yeah, and also, uh, if things don't go well, uh, Justin Trudeau, the PM of Canada, uh, has just made it easier to move there. <laughs> so, <laughs> <clears throat> no wall between the United States and Canada. He did, he did that last week. Uh, uh, you do know that Donald Trump at one point said that we might build a wall between the U.S. and Canada, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. I do. I do. I do remember Scary that. stuff. Scary stuff. Um, all right. Well, that'll do it for us for today, Z. Go ahead and give us that uh, infamous 411. The 411 on uh, com. Uh, please go there, uh, find our support page, uh, and after you support us uh, by giving a contribution to the show, uh, you can explore the rest of the site and find out everything about us. All right, that'll do it for today. Uh, promise a lot of good stuff tomorrow. In the meantime, uh, go to, again, tandztalk.com. I'm Tony Truppiano for Richard Zombeck, and as always, we ask that you be well. Oh yeah, can you feel it? Just over the credits, just riffing now. Words and chords. Not the poetry and the real thing, but not bad for an ad lib. Not good, but... long enough so just do a little bit more and that's nearly done that's the final credit there. that's the end <laughs>